So, 31st May today, Pentecost Sunday. And I thought it was very appropriate that we go into Pentecost Sunday at the time when we're doing end times. And sometimes people say, why Pentecost Sunday? Is it related to the end times? So I want you to see as we unfold, and it's going to help us understand how the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, has made a world of a difference for each one of us as disciples. Huh? So first of all, uh, if you could follow the video clip of your Bible, the visual reading is from John, from chapter 13, verses 31 to 14, verse 7. If I give you a little bit of time to turn to it. Uh, you don't have to use NIV, but uh, if you have NIV, it will be useful. Now, this is the setting for it. Now, this is the scene during the Last Supper. Jesus, Judas had really gone out to do what he had to do to betray Jesus. And it will provide the context to the coming of the Holy Spirit. So with an open Bible, let's begin to watch. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The background to this, uh, to this passage was that he, Jesus spoke to his disciples that he was going to leave and he was going to be away back to the Father and that they cannot go with him then. And the disciples were troubled in spirit and were fearful. They were troubled because Jesus was going away and they feared the future without their Lord and Master Jesus. So, uh, but one of the things we note that Jesus tell them before he said he's going back to the Father, within that conversation, he says that uh, you are to love one another. And in the light of his later, his later words, 
at the Mount of Olives, we could understand why that loving one another is going to be a very important part of the community of God. Because in the days ahead, in the times of trouble, what's going to happen is that people will betray one another. But if we have that love of God in the community, it will not happen. So when they express, when Peter says, where are you going? Why can't I go with you now? Jesus responds with this. Let not your heart be troubled. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So Jesus promises to return again. Now, so you, we, you and I need to let the Lord assure us that his going away is not going to be forever. He's coming back again. So the disciples, they didn't know when he was going to come back again, but Jesus says, I will come back again for you. So today it's the same for us. We have heard of wars and rumors of wars, uprisings, nations rising against nations and kingdom against kingdoms, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. And there's a lot of fear of unknown, the fear of, of uncertainty and of suffering. We are like in the same situation as the disciples. But I think we need to remind us ourselves that he said he's returning for us. The end, let's look at the end to live our life forward. He's coming back. So he encourages us, don't be troubled. I'm going back to the Father and I will come back for you. And in my Father's house, there are many mansions, he said. There's room for each one of us. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, not only did he promise us that he's returning back for us, but he says something very strange. He says he promises to be with us till the end. So how can that happen? He's leaving to the Father, and yet he promised to be with us till the end. How is that going to happen? So I want you to uh, look at John 14, 15 to 18. If you love me, Keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So, the reality of God's presence, he promises to be with us. Let's just look at the verse that Jesus said in uh, New King James Version. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper. The word another is not another of a different kind, but another of the same kind. Another helper or advocate or comforter, different translation uses that and that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And that's the power of uh, this promise of Jesus is that when he goes back to Father, he will come back to us. How does, not just only at the end of the age, but he sends someone who will represent him, who will be just like him, another comforter, another helper, just like him. And, for, and through that, he will not leave us orphans. And the Holy Spirit that comes will dwell with us and will be in us. So now the, the marvel of his truth is that when Jesus was on earth, he was with the 12 disciples. But when he went back to the Father, and the believers that come after that, can all have Jesus in their heart because the Holy Spirit now dwells with us. So the reality of God's presence comes with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just a force somewhere. He dwells in us and in his coming, we know the reality of God's presence. So what else did Jesus promise to the disciples to comfort their troubled hearts? Follow the scripture as well. 
All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. The sight of reality of God's presence with us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said one more thing to his troubled disciples. He says that that spirit of peace, this spirit will bring the peace of God into your heart. And I want you to watch this word, the gift of his peace. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, the one who come alongside with you, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What comforting words we have from the Lord as he goes. He says, it's better for you that I go than that I stay. And the disciples could not understand that. What could be better than Jesus physically with them? But he says, when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. I won't leave you an orphan. I'll come back to you. The Holy Spirit will teach you everything concerning what I've said. He will be just like me. He will bring to remembrance all that I've said to you. And through him, you're going to find peace. And your heart will find peace within. And, and that's the, uh, the essence of the Pentecost that I want you to note this morning. Not just that it came to initiate and begin the church and give an identity to those who are believers and a mission. He came for each one of us to bring God's presence with you, with us, and to give us peace. And I think we really need to experience these two, first two things, the presence, the reality of God's presence, and the peace of God. And I want to assure you that you and I can because the Holy Spirit has been poured forth. And today, as we seek His face, as you and I develop a relationship with Him in this spirit of uh, confinement in our home, as we give time to the Holy Spirit, we're going to build our spirit and build ourselves up in the presence of God and in the peace of God. And we're going to be able to withstand every challenge that comes before us. That's why Jesus said, pray that you not enter into temptation. When the disciples failed to pray, and when the testing, the temptation came, they failed. Jesus prayed through in the Garden of Gethsemane. When they came and arrested him, he was in absolute peace. We saw him in the Garden of Gethsemane with great agony as he wrestled with the future that was before him. He too was afraid of the pain and the suffering that would come to the cross. But as he sought the face of the Lord and prayed, and the angel of the Lord came and strengthened him, then he came to a place where he was at peace with his future and with what God has for him. As a result of that, when the enemies came, when the people came to arrest him, he was a picture of peace and calm. And I believe there's a picture to us of the days ahead of us, the challenges ahead of us. It is you and I who built on a relationship of his reality, of his presence, who seek his face, who prays and lets the presence of God give us the peace of God that's going to be strengthened for the day of test. So now that's Jesus. Now in between his promise to them and the cross, you see that the disciples were running helter-skelter. They were afraid, even though Jesus said, don't be troubled, don't be afraid, I give you peace. But 
they were confused, they were afraid because they saw their Lord crucified on the cross. What made a difference with them after that? Was it just only his resurrection? Yes, that was a very powerful part. They saw him alive again and that settled the question of whether he was God or not. But it was in the later coming of the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit came, the disciples were transformed. So we need to look again at the day of Pentecost. It's not just an experience 2,000 years ago. And for some of us, just the baptism with Spirit many years ago, but to see it as an ongoing being filled with the Spirit of God. So then the day of Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 disciples in the upper room. Now we're going to watch another reading, reading of the scripture from another group. So the face of Jesus and Peter all changed, okay? They're different people now, so don't get confused, all right? Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each. filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So we see the coming of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I want you to know what Jesus said to them. He says to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And after he said all these things, the Bible you saw in that uh, uh, scripture reading from Acts, that Jesus was taken up to heaven and uh, and the two men standing beside them says, why do you look up to heaven? He's going to come back again the same way. And that matches up with what we looked at the end time, Jesus coming back in the clouds again. But I think another interesting thing about the coming of the Holy Spirit is that it is an indication that Jesus is now in the right hand of God the Father. You see, because Jesus said, I go back, I will go to my Father's place and, from, and, you, and I will pour out my Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the disciples realized, hey, Jesus is now at the right hand of God the Father. And this is what one of the, uh, I think it was Stephen that preached later on and says that, that from where he was up in heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit. So when the coming of the Holy Spirit, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, 
we receive power, power to become witnesses. And we saw that in the disciples' life. Not only were they powerful in their witness, in the healing of the sick, but they received the power to withstand every persecution and every trouble that came. You know, Peter, Paul, all of them, all the disciples ultimately died very painful death, except for Apostle John, who lived to a ripe old age. But all of them died very a painful death, but they were strong because of the Holy Spirit. They received power. So, and, and you see the immediate effect of the coming of the Holy Spirit on Peter was that Peter preached his first message with boldness and anointing. Now, the next video you, you, read, you will see here of that passage by Peter, uh, you know, I always imagined when Peter stood and preached that he preached like Pentecostal charismatic preachers full of power and anointing. But uh, uh, the way they portrayed it isn't exactly that. But I believe that's the power of the word itself. Let's just watch and follow with the scriptures. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. That's only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. So Peter addresses the, cr the crowd and he explains this phenomena and he points it that this is something that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And, uh, and when he explained the prophet Joel, uh, it was a very familiar verse to the Jews about the last days, the days when God's going to bring about his day, where he's going to bring judgment on the earth and he's going to institute and restore his kingdom. But Peter explained it in the context of Pentecost 2000 years ago. All right. And it shall come in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see dream visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the 120 disciples ushered in the church age and the beginning of what Prophet Joel calls the last days. That will culminate in what Jesus said of the day of the Lord. Okay, in the mark of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that we are all be able to have revelations from God of the things that God wants to do in the spirit realm. You see dreams, you see, you see visions or stream, dream, dreams or to prophesy. All that requires us to have a connection with God through the Holy Spirit where he speaks to us about what he's doing today, what he intends to do. So, and for some people, it comes forth in prophecy. For some people, he reveals it in dreams. And some, is visions. And for some, it's to prophetic teaching as we teach the mind of the Lord. But whatever it is, it's not going to be dead uh, scripture, uh, uh, legalistic things like the scribes and the Pharisees. Every one of us should have a living input from the Spirit of God, right? In uh, something like what Jesus was like when he ministered for three and a half years. He spoke the things of God and that made an impact on the hearts of people. And this is where Prophet Joel calls this the last days. I want you to watch this verse in his message. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whoever calls for the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you not see the same cosmic signs are mentioned here that are mentioned in Matthew 24 and in the opening of the sixth seal. The sun in darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. 
So Joel's prophecy is in was in fulfillment at the time of the day of Pentecost, but it will be finally completely fulfilled in the days before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we see that the disciples were changed. Watch this Acts chapter 4 verse 1 to 23 in the uh, aftermath of the healing of the, uh, uh, the lame person sitting at the gate beautiful in the temple. The priests and the captain of the the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, shown to a cripple, and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you, and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. But we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So, you know, there was boldness in Peter in the uh, action and the speech. You know, some of us were uh, are worried that when we face challenges to our faith, are we going to be able to uh, be bold and not deny the Lord? And I want to assure you that the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. That's why we need, we need to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So what did Peter and John do after the threats by the leaders of the Jews? They called for a prayer meeting and they asked for boldness. Let's just watch this. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. 
Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So, you know, there was boldness in Peter in the uh, action and the speech. You know, some of us were uh, are worried that when we face challenges to our faith, are we going to be able to... Uh, be bold and not deny the Lord. And I want to assure you that the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. That's why we need, we need to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So what did Peter and John do after the threats by the leaders of the Jews? They called for a prayer meeting and they asked for boldness. Let's just watch this. Can I invite you now together to read this scripture together with me, this prayer for boldness. So to the count of three, after that, let's read it, all right? One, two, three. And being let go, they went to their companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage and the people plot? The kings of the earth took the stand. The rulers would get against the Lord and against this Christ. For truly, your holy against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before you. Now, Lord, look on your threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness and may speak your word by stretching out your hand and that signs and wonders may be granted in the name of the Holy Spirit, Jesus. They had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When the Holy Spirit comes on us, which I believe will happen again before the end comes, in a very powerful way, we're going to be filled with boldness. None of us are going to be afraid. And uh, as we look at the uh, summary, see, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what do we experience? Number one, the reality of God's presence. Number two, the peace of God. Number three, boldness in speech and action. Today, if we fail to see that mark of the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, it is not because God's Spirit has lost His power, but because we have lost His presence. We have lost the awareness of the Holy Spirit. So let's come into the relationship again with God. Let's begin to seek Him in prayer at home and as a church. And this is my personal belief. When the second half of the Great Tribulation begins, or even before, there will be a second major outpouring of the Holy Spirit as spoken of in Joel. It will again be like in the days of the early church. Because the prophet Joel says that there is the former reign and the latter reign. The former reign was when Pentecost happened and the reign that came to begin the harvest. All right, that was poured forth, was mighty, and the church grew. But at the end of the harvest, before the harvest, there will be an outpouring of what they call in Israel the latter rain. And I believe we are heading for that time. We're heading for the time of the Holy Spirit's outpouring on the church. And when that happens, brothers and sisters, we are going to experience God in a very different way. We're not going to, none of us are going to be afraid. We're going to receive that boldness that comes with the supernatural. So let's begin to press into the things of God. 
And let's read this together again. Now, this scripture verse that we read in uh, on Wednesday uh, at the prayer meeting, and I believe this is what God's call us to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Remember the uh, Peter's explanation, he says that, no? and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In that day when the Lord pour out his spirit afresh in the latter rain, uh, people are going to respond to the word of God and through the, through the words that God's going to put in your mouth and that you, may, you and I may speak and uh, see God's glory come upon the people of God. 